Yes, I'm going to present you another um, interesting paper that I uh, came to know about a few weeks ago during the SCATS AI summer school. Um, the main author was there and presented the paper. And um, then three weeks ago at the machine learning paper reading group at HZPR, uh, someone gave a talk about um, uh, neural architecture search, and then I was reminded of this paper and thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to um, present another method in this area. So um, the main idea behind uh, searching for networks that are um, small and efficient originates uh, from the problem that a lot of people throw a lot of big over-dimensionally uh, heavy neural nets on problems and don't really achieve a much higher accuracy from it. So we had um, the VGG and VG, uh, VGG 16 and 19 um, nets that were relatively popul popular, which only achieved around 70% accuracy while having 155 million parameters. So training these nets takes a lot of time and is um, not as efficient as, for example, uh, for example in inception, the network inception. Um, there are methods to reduce uh, the amount of connections or parameters inside of a neural net. And uh, these all fall into the category of neural architecture search. And in this table I am, that I found, uh, here is compared the methods of mainly 2018 versus new state-of-the-art methods from 2019. You see that um, the parameter size has uh, reduced significantly and uh, GPU usage has also um, uh, the, the amount of time that was needed to search for these architectures has also reduced incredibly. So keeping that in mind, the paper I'm going to present you is um, from 2018 and has an evolutionary approach. Yeah, most methods need a significant amount of computation power. Um, but why? Why should we invest even in, in shrinking down neural nets to solve our task? Because we have cloud storage, we have multiple GPUs, we have TPUs, we have high performance computing and so on. And if we have low accuracy, so first thing I learned during uh, my, my deep learning course I took in, in Wordsworth was build bigger nets and throw more parameters on it. So just stack more layers and this, the problem gets solved automatically. So what I've already told you about the mo motivations, um, when we scale down networks, they hopefully um, can apply to multiple, um, multiple problems and even grow with their tasks. Um, we can, when we have small networks and they have a very small size, we can throw them to our smartphones or on embedded devices um, and take them with us for portable usage. With a small network, um, we could achieve a better interpretability because neural nets are very, are very, yeah, are, are basically a black box and uh, keeping it small or even following the, the KISS principle, keep it simple and stupid, um, makes it better to understand it even for people programming these nets and who have actually experience in building neural nets. 
The authors of the paper promised that with a quadratically few and that with quadratically fewer parameters, you have a quadratically lower computation time, which sounds appealing at first, but we will see if this applies. And if we think about the origin of neural nets, they stem from um, our understanding of the human brain. And what we know so far is that neurons grow their connections over time during learning, uh, or they, they, um, they get stronger, or they, um, they don't lose the connection overall, but the connection get, gets weaker over time while you are not training the same thing over and over again. Uh, also, biological neural networks are typically sparse. So with biological networks, they mean um, networks that grow um, biologic after biological um, um, after what uh, or in a natural way, like social networks, for example. And um, another uh, thing that they discovered and kept in mind while building this method was that humans seem to reduce um, the connections between neurons during sleep as well. So going over to the methods. In neural nets, let's imagine that we have two layers of neurons and each are connected each neurons in each layer is connected to each other this is typically um, a, a fully connected layer between two layers of neural nets and um, the weights for these connections are stored in the in the weight matrix um, you see there um, wk and you see that there are a lot of small weights uh, surrounding um, zero in this weight matrix. And uh, if we pick these weights, um, they take up a lot of space, uh, computational space, um, or storage in better words, um, although they are not so relevant um, overall for decision-making. Decision so if we zero these connections and um, delete it by that mean, um, we can free up the space and only keep the important information. That doesn't mean that while learning, these connections won't reappear in the future. Um, if they're strong enough, they can be kept. Um, there is another technique in um, uh, building neural nets that's, uh, that's called dropout, which is similar if you think about the basic concept, uh, but uh, during um, or including dropout in your network means that you switch off randomly some neurons in a layer, but the connections are kept. And only um, the connections of active neurons are changed over time. And due to randomness, some of these connections might never be touched during training. This is rare, and I don't think it will happen too often, but it can. Um, yeah, so this is the main difference to um, the method that is um, proposed in this paper. So let's dive into some coding. This is the pseudo code that the um, authors suggested. Uh, we have, we initialize our artificial neural network, which can be a restricted Boltzmann machine, multi-layer perception, um, convolutionary neural nets, you name it. Um, so this method applies to a lot of um, neural network architectures. Uh, and we set two parameters, epsilon and zeta. 
And before we dive, uh, we will dive into this for loop first to um, explain a bit more what is going on there. We first define a so-called sparse connected layer, which is um, consisting of two neuron layers and the connections between them. And the layer has nk neurons, and this can be displayed in a vector. The um, connections are stored in the uh, weight matrix, just like um, we've seen before, a few slides before. And now this is um, the fact that uh, that um, differentiates sparse connected layers to uh, fully connected layers. Because um, two neurons are uh, only having a connection between each other by this probability. Um, and this is, yeah, this is something that, that uh, differentiates efforts. Extensive. Oh, sorry, is there a question? Someone dropped out. Oh, okay. Um, and e epsilon controls the sparsity. So as you can see, epsilon is inside this probability and um, it changes uh, the amount of connections there are inside a sparse connected layer. And if epsilon is very much lower than nk and nk plus one, the number of connections is um, epsilon times nk plus nk minus one, which is linear. Um, and in fully connected layers, this amount of, uh, and the number of connections would be quadratic. And this is where um, the, the, they save a lot of computation time already. Going back to uh, the pseudo code, um, then you initialize your normal training algorithm like you would do with any neural net you want to you want to train. And then we step into our training loop. Uh, we perform the standard training procedure and perform the standard uh, weights update. So the back forward and back propagation. And after back propagation, we um, step into another, another for loop. And I'm going into more detail, detail about this. Um, because only keeping random weights won't be sufficient for this method. Um, we delete a fraction zeta of the smallest positive and the largest negative weights. So if you think back to this weight matrix, we determine zeta to be 0.42, for example, and then delete um, the, this, this amount of connections. So if we change zeta to be higher or lower, we uh, then control the amount of connections that are deleted. And then we add new connections, new random connections to simulate, um, to simulate um, mutation and the selection of um, um, normal or, or uh, real world behavior. And if we are at the last epoch in our training algorithm, then the topology is kept and we don't add any new random connections. Let's dive into some results. Um, they trained uh, their or tested their methods uh, on uh, several data sets. Uh, here on the typical Hello World example for neural nets, the MNIST dataset of written hand digits. 
And on, in the first row, uh, they worked with um, 500 neurons. And in the second row, they implemented a network of um, a a 2,500 neurons. And as you can see over time, oh, sorry, over time, um, the connections uh, in, on the edges get deleted more often because they don't matter too much for handwritten digits. Because um, yeah, in the, in the last row after 500 epochs, you see that um, it resembles the shape of an eight, which is, I would say, the number that occupies the most space of, of these uh, handwritten digit images. And um, so the, the shape eight resembles um, um, or has the most information inside. And that is why um, uh, going from the edges of the, the number eight to the middle, the network decides which digit it is actually. I hope this is, I'm transferring my point right. Um, if we consider another data set, this is the Caltech uh, 16 times 16 object uh, data set. Um, you see that over time, especially with uh, 2,500 neurons, um, that the concentration of um, more connections is more around um, the edges of the pictures. Because I think um, the outlining shape of an object here is more crucial to know for the network than what's happening on the inside to determine which action it is actually. They tested it also on uh, multi-layer perception networks. And here you see that uh, with a state-of-the-art multi-layer perception um, network consisting of fully um, uh, connected layers uh, with um, a lot of parameters, they achieve almost the same accuracy on the MNIST and CIFAR-10 um, data set with only 4% of the amount of parameters. And um, the um, MLP fixed prop is just an, an, a network that is um, the counterpart to the set MLP method, so the uh, sparse evolutionary um, training algorithm. Um, and there they have the, the fixed probability over all training epochs to add new connections. Um, so yeah, they could uh, even reduce or outperform the uh, method with the fixed probability and uh, results uh, for um, against the fully connected layer that um, neural network is, I think, impressive. And here's the method on convolutionary neural networks. And even here, you see that um, they outperform the accuracy uh, while only having about 4% of the amount of parameters they need to train. So all in all, sorry, um, they tested uh, it on 15 data sets, uh, their method. Um, set could outperform the accuracy of all state-of-the-art implementations with um, a significantly lower amount of parameters. Um, it could outperform its counterpart. It has a scale-free topology, so um, the amount of connections is only controlled by a power law, in this case Erdős Renyi. Um, the network is kept small during training, so it doesn't need to be pruned afterwards. So all the, uh, a lot of the methods I showed you at the very beginning in the background, they try to prune network connections after they have been trained. So a new neural net needs to be trained in a lot of, with a lot of effort to prune networks 
And um, with this method, you can implement it relatively easy while training your network on your task and problem you want to be solved. And it can be adopted to supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning, which are the three main um, machine learning methods used at the moment. There's still a limitation, the authors said, they say, um, that hardware, especially GPUs, are not optimized for sparse metrics multiplication. And therefore, the authors suggest to calculate uh, the neurons activations based on their input parallelly. Um, this means that um, you parallelize, um, you have to compute it for each neuron and not layer-wise. And this is not implemented in common libraries. You have to come up with your own implementation for this. But um, I did a quick experiment on my laptop to see if this really has a big effort. And you can also test it yourself. I will give you the, the link. They provided um, um, a tutorial for implementing the set methods of TensorFlow. And um, it was just one experiment on my laptop, but uh, the set MLP took about half an hour for 400 epochs, and the fully connected MLP took around 40 minutes to finish the 400 epochs. So I think it's not really that big of a deal uh, that the hardware is not optimized yet. But we can, we, I think we can achieve good results if this gets implemented someday. Yeah. Okay, so these are my references and I, yeah, I thank you very much for being here and listening. And if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to ask them.